Hi, I'm Brad Steinman from Dimensional Fund Advisors, and I'm with Ken French, a professor of finance at Dartmouth College and also a director here at Dimensional. Ken, many investors around the world seem to have a huge portion of their equity portfolio invested in their home country. I'm from Canada. Uh, our market capitalization is about 4% of the world, yet it isn't uncommon uh, to see portfolios that have 80 to 90 percent uh, invested in Canadian companies. How do you explain that and why should investors diversify globally? Well, first, you shouldn't feel too defensive about being from Canada. It's not unusual at all for investors to hold a much larger fraction of their portfolio in their home country than their country represents in the global portfolio. So if we were thinking about a country allocation, sort of a top-down approach would suggest people ought to go and say, okay, what's my country look like proportionately in the world portfolio? Canada's 4% in the world portfolio. Maybe I ought to hold 4% of my portfolio in Canada. The U.S. is, say, 46% in the world portfolio. Maybe I ought to hold 46% of my portfolio in the US. Well, what people actually do is they tend to hold a lot more of their portfolio. They give up some of the benefits of diversification. And has that changed at all through time? It has. It's, it's gotten a little bit better, perhaps even more than a little bit better. When we look at international diversification, people are diversifying more. US investors, for example, 1980, U.S. investors held about 2% of their portfolios outside the U.S. If we look at 2007, which is the last year I've seen the data, in 2007, U.S. investors held more than a quarter of their portfolio, about 27% of their portfolio, outside the U.S. Now, we're still giving up some of the benefits of diversification, but we're much better than we were 30 years ago. So there still is quite a bit of home bias. And why do you think people would do that? Well, there's been a lot of papers written on this topic in the academic literature. And some of the suggestions relate to consumption risk. So suppose I'm in the U.S. I consume, most of the things I consume are produced here in the U.S., denominated in U.S. dollars. What I might want to do then is invest in the U.S., to sort of hedge against dollar risk. So if, for example, I invest outside the U.S. in a foreign currency, I mean, I'm investing in Japan, I'm investing in the U.K., I'm investing in Germany, and the dollar gets a lot stronger. When I bring those foreign currencies back into U.S. dollars, I'm not able to buy as many U.S. dollars with it, and that means I'm not able to buy as many U.S. goods with it. So that may cause me to tilt back to the U.S. when I'm investing. So they're giving up diversification benefits, uh, but are there any other behavioral reasons which would lead someone to overemphasize their home country? Well, there's at least two. One, I like to explain in terms of Donald Rumsfeld's classic line. He was President George W. Bush's Secretary of Defense. And what he famously said was, there's what you know, and there's what you don't know, and there's what you know you don't know, and then, critically, there's what you don't know you don't know. And when it comes to investing, it looks like people feel comfortable about what the risks are in their home country, and then as they leave their home country, they start to be less sure about where are the risks, what might get them. So it's Rumsfeld's inside the U.S. for me, for example. It's I know what I don't know. But then when I go outside the U.S., I don't even know what I don't know. And that creates what Frank Knight, who was an economist in the first half of the 20th century, the distinction between risk and uncertainty. Well, that uncertainty outside the U.S. may be pushing investors to tilt less of their portfolio outside their home country. So the analogy here of 
I suddenly get bit by an alligator and I didn't even know I was in a swamp. Okay, so if I'm concerned about am I in a swamp or am I out of space and, you know, or could the room catch on fire? You know, I don't know what the sorts of risk might be. Well, gee, I may not even want to go there because I don't know what environment I'll even encounter. A second reason people might overweight their home country has to do with overconfidence. I might think if I go and invest in Japan, well, probably the Japanese are going to be better than I am at picking the winning stocks in Japan. But when I come home, oh, I know about the U.S. I'll be able to pick winners in the U.S. Since I think I can beat the U.S. market, maybe I can't beat the Japanese market, that's going to induce me to overweight the U.S. market. The trouble with that is I'm quite confident not only can't I beat the Japanese market, I personally can't beat the U.S. market, and I don't think very many other investors can beat the U.S. market either. So I think this is just gross overconfidence inducing people to do this one. Ken, you've offered some explanations for why investors tend to uh, overweight their home country, um, yet you've suggested they're giving up some benefits, uh, diversification primarily. Uh, can you offer any guidelines in determining that trade-off? Yeah, when I think about my own personal portfolio, I start, as I mentioned earlier, with a top-down approach. I assume, okay, my default is I'm going to hold the global market portfolio, global stock portfolio, global bond portfolio. I just, let me default to all the assets out there in the world, and then I have to talk myself into something other than that. So yes, I invest more in the U.S. than you, the U.S. market's weight in the global portfolio because of hedging consumption risk, for example. But I still have a significant amount invested outside the U.S. trying to capture that diversification benefit. Thank you very much, Ken, and thank you for watching.